Kia ora koutou. And kia ora rawiri. I probably don't need to speak really because he kind of just um, summed it up pretty well actually. Um, nā mihi ki te, um, uh, ki te mana whenua, uh, tūwhari toa. Uh, nā mihi ki te kai whakarite, te wai Māori. Um, e nga mihi ki te rātou uh, kai kōrero. Uh, kei te tūau ki te um, ki roto uh, Naheri Totara. It's a, it's a real honour to be here today and be uh, have been presenting um, to be presenting amongst others that have um, yeah been some amazing talks. Uh, ko Ayo, uh, ko Fakapunaki te maunga, ko Wairua te awa, uh, ko Kahangunu te iwi, um, i te Pukio ki Rotorua, uh, i Naya Nei, uh, no Fakatua Ho. So between that, I feel I've got a good chunk of the middle of the country pretty well covered. <laughs> so um, my, my talk today is, um, yeah, mountains to the sea. So we often think about kito kitai, so things moving from the mountains to the sea. But what about um, things going in the other direction, coming from the sea to the mountains? And um, our ika do, do that, um, you know, that's what many of our fish in New Zealand do. So yesterday we were talking about um, that connectivity between, it was questions were raised about how um, you know, resource management tries to split things off and there's the, the waiti on this side and the waita on that side. And um, but whereas our fish are just crossing that boundary all the time. And um, so yeah, this is, um, this is a, a talk based around uh, that kaupapa. And um, so where we're looking, we're looking in the Waituna catchment in the, um, uh, right down the bottom of the South Island in Murihiku. Um, so the Arunaka um, of um, Awarua. And one thing I really regret is I just don't have any, I'm not a great photographer and I don't have any of the really beautiful photos of um, Waituna Lagoon, but you really have to go down there. It is, it's beautiful. It's a really stunning place. And it's a, it's a real privilege to work in that area. Um, but also, like many of our uh, landscapes um, around the Motu, it's had a lot of pressures on it. Um, it used to be, um, there was, so there's the lagoon right down the bottom, which uh, drains into the Southern Ocean, and then um, buffering that all around was um, large swathes of the Awarua uh, wetlands. Uh, in the 1920s, many of those um, got drained and extensive um, uh, farmlands got, um, um, were put in, in the catchment. And now the Waituna Creek, which is the main um, stream flowing into uh, the Waituna wetland, is a pretty intensive agricultural, um, agricultural creek. But despite that, the, um, the Waituna Lagoon still remains a pretty, um, a pretty healthy ecosystem. So um, William Anadu was talking about our native plants yesterday, and this is one of the few of these sort of coastal lagoon ecosystems where we have these um, good, healthy um, aquatic plant communities. Um, so by comparison, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very similar ecosystem in a lot of ways to um, Te Wahora, um, uh, Onoki, Whakaki, these, these same barrier bar, um, sort of the, the kind of lakes, the kind of estuaries. Um, sometimes storms come, close them off, and they turn more into lakes. Sometimes the fresh water rises up, breaks through the barrier into the sea, and they kind of turn into estuaries. So they're not one, they're not the other, but um, they're really important uh, ecosystems. And um, uh, just to step back a little bit, the, the genesis or, um, of this work comes from, um, so Robin Holmes, who was talking before, he has been doing uh, stream habitat restoration in Watuna Creek, which flows into the lagoon, and um, so trying to improve the fish community within, the, um, within this um, quite modified uh, landscape. And um, so just a little bit of a background for some data. So you'll see uh, here's a, this is showing fish biomass, and this bottom graph here, this is a global assessment of fish biomass from all sorts of 
big rivers all across the world. And what we see in Waituna Creek is, is actually, you know, on a global scale, there is a lot of fish biomass in this creek. And, you know, see, like looking at this dot out here, over 900 kilograms of fish per hectare. And there was one that was way out at 43,000. So, you know, you're talking about a lot of fish in a small creek. Just to put that into numbers, you're talking, and most of this biomass was, um, was longfin eels. And just to put that into numbers, you're talking about if you were to walk along the side of the creek, you'd be, um, so, you know, every metre, you'd be standing on a tuna that's about half a metre long. So you know, there is a lot of fish in this creek. And um, just wondering why that is. So we think that um, what we're arguing is that the reason for this is because of that connectivity with this actually quite pristine um, ecosystem, the, the Waituna Lagoon. Uh, so Waituna Lagoon is... Um, uh, nationally, it's a really important uh, habitat for, um, for our galaxid species. Um, so that's giant kokapu and uh, inanga. And um, we think about, just thinking about the role of those inanga moving up into the stream, which um, you know, might not seem like a nice habitat in a lot of ways, but it's connected to this very pristine habitat, and those fish moving up being an important food resource. So... Um, at least when, when I was at university, there was, um, you know, one of the things that really captured my imagination was the idea that on the west coast of the US, there's the salmon run. So every year, the salmon come back up the streams, and um, and that's what the, you know, that fuels the bears, it fuels the the whole forest. So, you know, those um, those salmon coming up from the sea is what's driving uh, the ecosystem. And if we think about that idea in New Zealand. We've got the exact same ingredients, really. We've got, um, you know, we're uh, tuna, kind of like our slimy bears with no claws, and, um, and inanga are just like our slightly smaller salmon. So um, the, this study was really lucky in that it was able to, um, as that, quanti that data that I showed before, we're actually getting these fish biomass. So we were able to piggyback the study onto previous work, which um, you can see pictures of here with um, Rob, uh, Robin Holmes and other colleagues from uh, Doc and Cawthron, uh, collecting all this fish biomass data. So we were collecting these fish and measuring just you know, exactly how many were in the stream. And, um, and we were able to, so some of these fish um, that were collected, we were able to take samples from them. So um, we were, it was non-destructive sampling. So we were taking a sample from the fin so, um, so a, 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 a tissue sample, and we're able to analyze that tissue uh, to figure out what the diet was. So this is just a bit of a, um, an idea of uh, where Waituna Lagoon is. It's, you know, you've, you've got the very bottom of the South Island here, and so we're, this is Waituna Creek coming into the lagoon, and so this is just showing some of the areas that we sampled um, around the lagoon, and particularly up in the creek, which is where I'm mainly focusing on in this study. So um, this is where it gets a little bit, um, a little bit heavy, and that. So what we're doing is that how we're tracing our diet and um, how we're figuring out um, the who's eating what. And um, so we're not cutting the stomach open and looking at what's inside it. You have to kill fish to do that. We're able to do um, just take a, 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 a clip from the fin and work out what they're eating that way, based on um, the fingerprint. And people say, when I start saying stable isotopes, people kind of glaze over and start looking at their phones. But um, I actually really like explaining stable isotopes to Māori audiences because even though people hate this word, it's, it's really actually intuitive. That all it is is that you are what you eat. When you are in an... So, um, ko au te awa, ko awa te au. So, you know, when you're living by a river, you become part of that river. You literally do. So... You know, you, you drink the water from that river, you eat the kai from that river, and they, those atoms, they literally do become part of you. And that's just essentially what we're measuring. So um, every, so we get these, there's a, like essentially a, an atomic fingerprint from different places, 
and we can use that to, um, to trace diets. So we think about carbon, so you know, that's your, your fats and your carbohydrates, and we've got your, your nitrogen, that's your protein, so, and we can uh, basically, we can use these, uh, these fingerprints of these two uh, atoms and we can figure out what you're eating. So for an example here, we've got a cat that eats some, some mice and some birds, and uh, we can tell what trophic level it's at by the changes in the nitrogen value. And we can see, so it sits, a, it will sit a bit above, you can see it sits above the bird and above the, the mouse. And we see that these different, um, these different energy pathways have different carbon signatures. Now, a different scenario here, so we can see, we can kind of work out that it's got a, 50% of its diet comes from birds, 50% from um, mice, and so um, yeah, where it sits in the food chain, it's at about two and a half. So, and by comparison, if this cat just ate mice, like we wished all cats did, um, we can tell, it will have a carbon signature that looks identical to the mice, and it will be sitting at a trophic level three, so up here a bit more. So, um, I, yeah, so it's the idea that, you know, you are what you ate and you become part of your environment. So um, if you see me going pretty hundy out at the food stall, just know that I'm not being greedy, it's just um, trying to integrate with my environment. <laughs> and and you, can, you can all use that mataronga yourselves as well. <laughs> So um, now just, this is the actual data that we're showing here. So again, the, this uh, graph here is pretty similar to the one I was just showing with the cats and the mice. Um, and this is the value of, the, all the, um, of all the little critters that are living within the creek. So if, um, if our fish are eating um, food from the creek, we'd expect them to fall within, that, um, within this uh, circle here. Now we're looking at, we've got longfin tuna and we've got brown trout here, so two, two pretty hearty predators. And uh, what we see is that there's actually very few that look like they're feeding within the creek. So they look, you know, most of the animals here don't, um, yeah, they're obviously getting their food from something else. They, they look nothing like the creek. But then we add on the the lagoon resources, and all these fish that are living within the creek look like they're feeding, looking, they look like um, the lagoon, basically. And what we reckon that is because, is because we've got the inanga and the smelt, and you know, quite big numbers of inanga and smelt in this environment, and um, they are feeding within the lagoon. They've got really good, um, great habitat for feeding. They've got these plants that they can uh, swim around in. There's lots of zooplankton within that, and they, can, they grow nice and fat, and then they migrate up the stream for spawning, as they do, and, um, and, and we can see that that's obviously um, really fueling the growth of the, um, of the trout, um, and specifically the, uh, the, the longfin tuna. So um, this is just... Um, uh, just showing that you know, as we go further downstream, we do see a bit of a decrease in that lagoon signature. So we see that you know, a lot of the tuna, um, so you know, the, the inanga aren't getting all the way um, upstream, um, which is what we'd expect. Uh, and we see a similar signature for, um, for bullies. So this is just kind of showing that it's a bit of an indirect effect. So bullies, uh, they're not actually eating the inanga, but you know, we're seeing that effect um, still uh, being transported through the food web, maybe through scavenging of, um, of dead material and things like that. Um, and what this just shows is that, so the, this, the bubble size just shows the size of the tuna. So the, it is really these big tuna that are eating, um, that are mainly um, really seem to be, they're at a higher trophic level, and they are mainly eating, um, they're the ones that are really relying on these um, um, on these inanga. And um, so because we had all this good biomass data, we were able to actually start looking at some numbers and thinking, well, you know, given how much um, the number of 
um, of tuna within the stream, how much, um, you know, um, how much uh, inanga is supporting them. And we, so what we don't have is we don't know what the growth rate is. We don't know how fast they're growing. But what we can figure out is, well, if they're growing at, um, yeah, if we've got, we give a range of growth rates, so we know what the, um, uh, and from that we can work out, um, so how much, um, how much inanga would be needed to support um, specific growth rates. So, um, um, so say if they were going at about 25 millimeters a year, um, we would see uh, they'd need about um, almost up to two ton of inanga to support that. But also if we think about this the other way, if we're restoring inanga um, habitat and we're imp improving populations of inanga, we can be hugely increasing the growth rates of our eel. And I think that this is just as important for conservation. So, um, yeah, we can, we can create habitat for them, but, you know, if we're getting um, faster growth rates, we're, um, you know, we could almost um, double the rate of the population increases. You know, we think about we're getting return to spawning in, um, you know, in less time. So I, 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 this is the part that excites me really is the, the thought about how we could be using this as uh, conservation for tuna. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. And um, so that was just lastly, we, could, we can actually, we know what the, so you know, we know that our tuna grows slowly, but actually if we give them as much food as we can, they grow really fast. So, um, oopsie, sorry. So, you know, we can't, we, if, um, they could grow at, um, at, you know, sort of, we're talking 10 centimetres a year, they can um, grow at when they've been, you know, in sort of aquaculture environments when they're fed enough. So, you know, there's definitely potential here that we could be feeding them more and we can be having um, bigger growth rates. So, um, just a summary of um, what we're talking about here. So, you know, we're talking about these, this marine connectivity and if we can be um, trying to enhance this and, you know, really focusing on fish, this is, this presents a real opportunity for, um, for uh, tuna conservation uh, in New Zealand. And um, just moving on to some potential future work that, um, that one day we might get a chance to look at. But um, so Jen was talking about the otolis um, yesterday and how you know, we can count the growth rings in there and the spacing in that we can figure out how quickly um, these fish are growing. And, um, so the other thing that we can do is we can, as I was talking about the isotope signature, we can actually measure the isotope signature of these areas where we've got you know, periods of fast growth and periods of slow growth, and we can sort of say, okay, so when they're growing fast, when they're growing slow, um, how is, um, what is their diet? So we can be relating diet uh, to growth rates. And what I was specifically thinking about is um, so we we're talking. I was mentioned before that um, that the Waitunga Lagoon is, uh, in a lot of ways, similar to, um, say, for example, Te Waihora and um, Whakaki and these other um, these other um, these other kind of coastal lagoon environments. But we know that in um, in the 1960s um, there was the I think it was Hurricane Giselle came, which um, sunk the Wahine, and it also ripped all the macrophytes out of um, out of Te Waihora. So and that flipped the lake. It made it like dominated by algae after that point, um, algal blooms. And we know that the around that time that um, you know that, that that had an impact on the um, on the eel fishery um, on on the eel populations. And um, so we can actually. We have, so these otoliths, we've got archived um, version, archived otoliths. So we can go back and we can actually measure um, otoliths that were, um, that were collected and fish that were in the lake before that period of time. And we can see, um, we can compare diet and growth rate before and after. And um, I see this as an a, um, exciting tool for thinking about, um, for you know, driving uh, ecosystem restoration for um, for our tuna. Um, so yeah, no, that's all. I'll, I had a questions up here, but we won't be asking questions now. But um, yeah, thanks for your time, everyone. Dinakota. <laughs> <laughs>